We need to start rethinking the discussions that we are having surrounding politics and the future. The discussions we are having are clearly dysfunctional. Anybody can detect that. And we have to find our way out, which is very difficult because if somebody tells you you need to stop thinking that way, you begin to feel um, defensive about the things that you know are true and that we just need to, to accomplish. Um, <clears throat> the first way to get to a new conversation is to dichotomize um, between values and policy. Values are the things that you want to happen. They are the characteristics that you want your system to have. Policy are the mechanisms whereby you might get there. Um, now, this is where I'm going to argue that the dichotomy between right and left has come completely off the rails, and that to the extent we are still stuck in right-left arguments, um, it is an error, and it is, it is forcing us to have discussions that will never be able to solve the problems that we face. Now, I don't know how many of you have taken the political compass test. I recommend that you take the political compass test if you haven't taken it already. Now, I'm not going to endorse the test itself. The test itself is a bit noisy in terms of where it places you on this four-quadrant grid. But what I do want you to take away from this is the idea that these four quadrants are actually real. Now, the upper two quadrants are the authoritarian quadrants. So on the y-axis, we have authoritarianism on top and libertarianism on the bottom. Libertarianism is not economic libertarianism, I should point out. In the bottom two quadrants, you have uh, left libertarianism and right libertarianism. Now, what I am discovering ever more as I've been uh, tossed into a world of people um, discussing our current political dysfunction is that there is tremendous room for agreement amongst people who find themselves in the bottom two quadrants. There is almost no reason to disagree. Amongst those who prioritize liberty, there is very little reason to disagree because essentially um, a progressive and an economic libertarian, so a progressive being a left libertarian and an economic libertarian being a right-leaning libertarian, uh, share a belief that a fair system is desirable. What they disagree about is the wisdom of tinkering with the system in order to get to increased fairness. Now, I submit to you, we don't actually know enough to tinker with our system with the present toolkit in other words, if we were to employ the systems that are advocated by those on the left or the systems that are advocated by those on the right, we would find that they both failed to deliver the values that we, all of those of us on the bottom two quadrants here, would agree are desirable. What I will argue is that it is time for people in those bottom two quadrants, left libertarians and right libertarians, to unify against the authoritarians and to find new solutions which will exist on the z-axis. That is to say, not on that original diagram. These things don't yet have a name. We have to figure out what they are, and we will be much more likely to figure out what they are if we team up uh, between those bottom two quadrants. The other thing that is true is that there is an advantage strategically to those bottom two libertarian quadrants teaming up together that comes from the fact that the upper two quadrants can't stand each other. So they have a built-in disadvantage in the sense that left authoritarians and right-leaning uh, authoritarians are actually after two different worlds. Um, so strategically and logically, it makes sense to seek new sol solutions on the z-axis and to put aside archaic discussions of right and left that are incapable of solving the problems we face in any case. OK, um, now a word about utopianism. I'm going to say some things about the world that we ought to create if, if I'm right about where we are and what might be possible, and they may sound utopian to you. I, I assure you they are not. I find utopianism is probably the worst idea human beings have ever come up with. And if you don't believe that utopianism is a terrible idea, then study the latter half of the 20th century carefully, because really a tremendous amount of carnage resulted from utopianism. Um, Utopians do two things wrong, and this will help you understand what I mean by that term. The first thing utopians do wrong is they optimize for a single objective. Now, this is going to sound probably incorrect to you, but I'm speaking now scientifically. If you optimize any mechanism for a single objective, you will create catastrophes for every other value. It doesn't matter how glorious the objective you have in mind is. If you optimize for uh, justice, for example, then you will create 
um, a catastrophe for liberty, right? You will create a catastrophe for your ability to um, feed populations. You may feed populations equally poorly across the board, but you won't feed them well. So you have to grow past the idea that there's some objective worth pursuing at any cost, because if you pursue an objective at any cost, you will create a disaster for every other, and every other value. Um, now this results because of a concept that uh, if there's one concept, if I had to teach one concept to people that does more heavy lifting than any others, it's this concept which we've borrowed from economics. We tend to hear diminishing returns and think that it's an economic concept. It's not inherently an economic concept. Diminishing returns applies any place that a complex system intersects with an objective. If you have a complex system and there's an identifiable objective, diminishing returns will characterize the way that system functions. And so the reason that utopia is such a terrible idea is if you optimize for a single characteristic, you will run into severe diminishing returns and create catastrophes for all of the other things you might pursue. The other thing that utopians do wrong is they have a foolish kind of optimism about how much they know about the world that they are pursuing. They will think that they know how to construct it based on the things they understand, and they will tend to discount those things that they do not yet understand. So here is an example of a non-utopian. This is somebody who's created a cell phone using a Raspberry Pi. It's not a cell phone you would want. It's pretty cruddy, right? But it's a great prototype. You build one of those, then you know what you need to do the next time in order to make it better, to make it better, and sooner or later you end up with something like that that's actually highly functional. Um, so the ability to prototype a system rather than imagine that you know directly how to go to the solution is the key to building a civilization that functions. The civilization that I think we ought to build, again, I'm not telling you I know how to construct it, but I do think I know where the first prototypes would be. Um, the situation that we want to construct is a society that has what I would call engineered stable abundance. So remember that tyranny sets in because populations find a non-zero-sum circumstance, they capture all the resources, and then austerity sets in and people go after each other with tribalism. The alternative involves finding a mechanism to stabilize the sensation of abundance, to provide for people in a way that they actually feel they are living in an abundant, safe world that is protecting them. And it can't be a lie. It has to function well so that their needs really are taken care of. If you did that, then the program that human beings carry with them that allows them, yes, to compete, but to do so in ways that are not objectionable, those characteristics would come out and we would see the opposite of what we're seeing presently which is the onset of intense tribalism that will result in um, catastrophe. So um, here you have a picture of a hummingbird and I use this as my sort of icon for a non-utopian uh, stably abundant system. The thing about a hummingbird is they're marvelous. I don't know how much time you all have spent looking at them. Every time I encounter a hummingbird I feel that I have gotten as close to a miracle as anybody ever does, right? It's a marvelous creature, but it's non-utopian. This creature came about without a designer, and it, it functions on the basis of feedbacks, right? It does not function the way our system is constructed to function, where there's an oscillation between left and right. Um, the left gets in power, it gets overly enthusiastic about solution making, and it goes too far. That causes a backlash. The right takes over the system and becomes um, overly stingy and takes apart the solution making. That's a very crude mechanism for managing civilization. A hummingbird functions on the basis of automatic feedbacks that detect perturbations in different parameters and adjust characteristics so that the animal can go and do what it needs to do. If we're to build a civilization that functions, it will be based on feedbacks that allow it to self-navigate and self-correct without us having to um, have political arguments. Having agreed upon what the objective is, um, that objective can be deployed in a way that is very tightly controlled, but in a way that is not onerous to people. In other words, that, that society ought to be liberating just the same way the hummingbird is liberated to think about hummingbird concerns rather than thinking about regulating its temperature, people should be liberated to think about producing marvelous things rather than have to fend off their economic competitors for fear of losing their health care. Okay, now, the most important piece of hope that I find in looking at this landscape is that it would appear 
that certain of our predecessors may have figured this out already. Now, I'm not saying that they consciously figured it out or that they would recognize the description that I'm presenting. But um, I've become fascinated with many of the New World civilizations that have existed, in particular the Maya. Now, the Maya um, are often uh, mischaracterized because the Mayan Empire came apart before the Spaniards arrived. And so there is this connotation to the Maya that there was something that they were doing wrong. But the fact is they had existed for thousands of years doing the impossible before their civilization came apart. So we don't exactly know how they were doing it. But in places like Copan, a dynasty lasted a thousand years farming on fragile tropical alluvial soils with intensive agriculture. That's an amazing feat. The Maya, in fact, had a unit of time, the Bakhtun, which was 400 years long. This was such a far-sighted civilization that they actually needed longer timescales that they could describe than we typically use. So, at the same time, the Maya were prone to building these massive monuments that are so famous that don't appear to have any material purpose. They have a spiritual purpose, but they don't have a material purpose, and that's curious. Why would a civilization that um, is so far-sighted engage in a kind of waste like constructing these temples? Well, I won't go deeply into the idea here, but I will submit to you that the Maya may have found a mechanism for not turning new resources into more Mayans or more consumption by investing in these large temple structures, effectively giant public works projects. They enhanced the lives of the Mayan populace without creating so many Mayans in a good year that every bad year resulted in a lot of tribalism as a result of the fact that there was not enough food to go around. In a bad year, you don't invest in the temples. In a good year, you invest. And these temples, in fact, what you can't tell from the outside is that they were growing. These temples were layered on top of temples, and they would continue to grow ever larger. And in fact, the largest temples are, in a sense, a testament to how far-sighted the populations that built them must have been. All right, so what I have argued effectively is that there are three kinds of frontiers, and that we should be afraid that our built-in evolutionary systems have directed us to the third, most unfortunate kind of frontier, which is a sort of tyranny in which people steal from each other in order to restore a sense of growth. What I've argued here is that there is in fact a fourth hidden kind of frontier that involves us engineering a stable kind of abundance that will bring out the best in human beings. Thanks very much.